Okay. I haven't done Zoom in a long time, so I'm <laughs> getting back into it a little bit. No, How are you? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself? Good. Very good. Thank you. I like your background. Appreciate it. You know, that, uh, I'm not sure if you see it this way. It's one of the jets that I fly. That was the one I flew for uh, Baron Hilton for oh. about uh, 18 years. And I'm still flying it, as a matter of fact. I've got a guy that uh, bought it. Nice. And, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, well, so, we're definitely uh, definitely going to get into that, but I, I really appreciate you, you know, hopping on the call today. How's your day going thus far, though? Very well, thank you. I'm actually deep steeped in the uh, the trial going on right now. It's uh, you nice. know during d- during the social distancing and everything, I'm home a lot more, so I'm able to to uh, just live it and breathe it because I think it's probably the one one of the most important things that's ever happened in my lifetime. And uh, right. You know, I've seen a few changes in my life, you know, uh, went through the Vietnam War period. I went through, uh, you know, my parents went through uh, prohibition. They went through oh, wow. uh, depression and so forth. So all of these things, every generation has their own uh, pivotal moment right. that, that defines them. And uh, for millennials, it may have been uh, 9-11, for instance, you know, when that happened for, uh, for a lot of it. But this is affecting every one of us. This is huge. Yeah, and uh, right. you know our entire our entire uh, uh, country and what we stand for. Our constitution is at stake here. There's no question about that. You know, and I heard a great. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a terribly religious person, but uh, one of the quotes that I that I heard that was so appropriate. It was uh, uh, from the Bible, but uh, and it says, "Thou shalt not follow multitudes. Thou shalt not follow multitudes to do evil." Mm. You mind elaborating on that? Well, you know, you, uh, you mob rule. You know, it's been a, something throughout history that's been talked about. From the Roman times, they talked about the Senate, uh, right? You know, talking about mob rule and and uh, trying to feed the mob. You can never feed it enough because it will turn on you, right. <clears throat> and that sort of thing. I'm science based. I'm fact based. You know, when I fly, mm-hmm. and I've trained over 500 pilots in my in my career. Nice. Uh, and, and, and then some, yeah. And, uh, you know, the one thing I, I know about flying is you can't lie about it. You can lie about your women. You can lie about your money. Mm-hmm. You can lie about your politics. You can lie about all kinds of stuff. Right. You can't lie. You can't lie about the flying. No, it's either. It's, it's just fact or it's not, you know, unless you, uh, unless you go uh, full on catch me if you can. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, right? you couldn't do that. You can. Yeah. But you're, you're going to get caught in the lie. There's no question about it. You know, uh-huh. either, you know, and, uh, and uh, I read his book originally mm-hmm. and his story originally. And I saw a lot of fallacies in it. He made a lot of that stuff up. Right. No, absolutely. That, that whole thing was a lie. He, he, he couldn't, he couldn't fly that airplane. No. You know, he couldn't sit there and then turn the autopilot on and get away with that stuff. No. <laughs> he, he, first of all, we wouldn't invite somebody that we didn't know to do that. Right. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, you smell that real quick. I can work with somebody just a few minutes. That I already know who I'm working with. Okay. Yeah, you know, it, it's it. very revealing. It really is because, uh, yeah. you know, the consequences of doing something wrong are, are, are uh, definite. No, absolutely. I mean, if you crash a yeah. plane, then. There's really no, you know, turning back from there, I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. You landed the Hudson, right? Well, uh, you know, I know Scully. As a matter of fact, I've flown with him a few times. He's, oh, no a, way. he's, he, he's exactly what you think of him. He, he's just that way. He's a very capable, very humble person, mm-hmm. a very knowledgeable person. Uh, he came up as a guest of uh, Baron Hilton's to the ranch on a number of occasions. Nice. We actually flew, uh, I flew him uh, a few times. And uh, the last flight we flew, uh, Baron's uh, Beach Stagger Wing. It's 1943. I might send you a few photographs after this is over. I'd love just to so you can, yeah. So you can have some of those. You might edit them in or not. Yeah, you know, exactly. Mm-hmm. But uh, you'll have a reference then as we're talking, you know, if you want to do some of that. Uh, 1943 Beach Stagger Wing, which was at that time in the late 30s, uh, it was the fastest thing in the Army Air Corps inventory. It was a 200 mile an hour airplane. Oh, wow. okay. And uh, and it was executive transport, right? And uh, with a four four hundred fifty horsepower Pratt and Whitney engine on it, round engine, and uh, it uh, just a really cool airplane. It's like getting into an old old Cadillac from that era. Yeah. Well, yeah. Scully, Scully loved that stuff, so we took off and we went through the Sierras. We went over uh, uh, Angel Falls, you know, Yosemite, uh, 
you know, all that area too. You know, where'd so you he, meet him? Uh, up through the ranch, through Baron Hilton. You know, Baron okay. Baron uh, was very much an aviation nut. Okay. You know, he loved aviation. He uh, he's been flying since he was. He uh, he joined uh, the Navy right at the end of World War II, and he was a photographer's mate in Hawaii. He learned to fly while he was there. Got in a little Piper Cub and learned to fly there. And uh, yeah. when he was a kid, he'd ride his bicycle to Dallas Love Field to watch the airplanes take off and land. You know, so it was a it was a dream of his to fly. So uh, you know, he was always flying. He was a good stick too, really good stick. Uh, didn't cool. do a lot of instrument flying and things like that because he had no co- reason to. But uh, mm-hmm. but when I gave him his annual flight review every year and and uh, I just poured it on to him, you know, challenged him a lot. He loved it and he did fine because he was a glider pilot too. You know, sailplanes was a mm-hmm. huge thing. So he uh, he had these airplanes and then uh, and then uh, he surrounded himself with uh, legends of aviation and space. So I was fortunate because uh, I was. I was at that point. I got to I got to play ball with all the greats, you know. I got to fly regularly with Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. Uh, Gene Cernan, I love that guy, last man on the moon. Mm-hmm. Bill Anders, first to orbit the moon, you know, and uh, the astronauts. And then in aviation, I, I got to fly regularly with uh, incredible legends like Bob Hoover. Um, nice. And that's all through Baron Hilton. Yeah, that was my contact. I knew of these people. I knew of them, of course, and followed them. You know, and, uh-huh. and uh, you know, when I was in my teens, I watched you know the uh, the Gemini, the uh, uh, the Mercury, the Gemini, and the uh, Apollo missions and everything like that. Right. I was glued to the television. For that. So you were yeah. always interested in, in in air travel. Well, in in flying, yeah. I mean, I was one of those kids that built all the model airplanes and wished okay. I could fly. You know, I grew up about. Uh, two two and a half mile final to o'hare field in chicago and uh, ord is the three letter identifier for that airplane airfield but that was based on old orchard airport it was a joint use uh, military civilian airport and then many years later it became the major airport uh, in chicago but uh, i had uh, airplanes coming over the top of my house you know on final approach or departure uh, mm. oh, since I was a little kid, I remember the very first Boeing 707, the first jet transport took off. I have an early uh, image of a super constellation coming in low over my house with one engine shut off and the uh, propeller feathered as it was heading back in an emergency landing. I can remember as a child a uh, formation of three Bell helicopters coming over and one of them had uh, President Eisenhower. Ike was on board, you know, so it, uh, oh. aviation was all around me. And of course, uh, uh, so that, that was something that, that was a dream of mine all my life. You know, as a matter of fact, when I was seven years old, I had a dream, a real dream, uh, not a daydream. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I found myself, I was, a, I was a grown man, young man. I believe I was in uniform and I was walking across, uh, a grass field to the airplanes that were waiting for us. I was with a group and we got in the airplanes and we took off. And the sensation was exactly that of flying. I remember the smell of the, uh, of the oil in in flight and things like that. It was so real. I woke up and I said, my God, I was actually flying years later when I finally took, you know, my first flight, that sensation was the same. The same thing. So, there you go. A little bit of foreshadowing. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that transition was made from, you know, just a young boy that really enjoyed, you know, aviation and flying to actually becoming a pilot? Well, it, it comes down to money. There's two ways of doing it. Uh, either way, you're going to pay. My friends that went through the military, they paid by getting shot at a lot. Right. Some of us, then <laughs> I, yeah, I was in that in-between age. I should have been drafted, but, but by then the, the Vietnam War was... Uh, drawing to a close. And, uh, you know, I, I had, I had a low lotto number, but, uh, they just didn't call me. I should have been taken in there, but, uh, I didn't, I didn't get into aviation until later on. I was probably 30 years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to go out and make a living somewhere. And then I ended up plot, plopping the, uh, the charge card down. And I really went into debt to learn to fly. I started out in gliders. That was, that was my first, uh, first attempt and i loved it uh 
So between the ages of 18 and 30, prior to you putting that money down, what were you doing? Well, I have a colorful past, you might say. I was a, I was a song and dance man All right. in a musical theater. I was a triple threat. I was a singer, an actor, and a dancer. And uh, before I was in musical theater, I used to compete in, uh, in uh, all the ballroom dancing. The stuff you see on Dancing with the Stars, I oh, did no all that professionally. Yeah, I don't look like it now, but you know, <laughs> I was slender like you and in great shape and uh, oh, dancing my butt off, you know. And uh, I did look pretty great. good. Still look great. Well, yeah, because I'm on camera from here up. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, I did that. That was a calling. And then, uh, you know, I, I was a high school dropout mm -hmm. and, oh, uh, okay. I got into sales and marketing with different companies. And, uh, you know, if they didn't ask me about my educational record, I could wall them and dazzle them with, uh, Your sales you know, skills. my street, my street yeah. sense, my, my sales skills and so right. forth. So I, I did that and did pretty good, but I knew that, uh, Flying was my thing. I came out to Southern California probably in 86. Um, I had been doing commercials, industrial films, uh, radio, voiceover work, uh, and some little, little bits in feature film and that sort of thing. So I came out here and I was flight instructing in Torrance Airport uh, in the Bay, uh, the South Bay, it's called. Uh, so you grew up in the Bay Area? No, no, I grew up in Chicago. Oh, okay. Just, okay. Yeah, I even had a stint uh, after high school. I had a stint as a yellow cab driver for about. Uh, all right, nice. Yeah. So, so yeah. What, what made you move to the Bay Area, and when did that year with, or uh, how old were you? Well, well it was it, it was interesting. I had uh, ended up in Houston. I was in Houston. I learned to fly in Houston, Houston Hobby, okay, the airport, and I was also uh, doing my my musical theater stuff there and my commercials, industrial film. I built up all my skills and my clients there, so I would. Uh, fly i would rent an airplane instead of paying uh southwest airlines to fly from houston to dallas i'd rent a little grum and tiger you know sliding canopy the whole bit and uh, fly up to dallas oh okay and uh, i do an audition there i do a radio spot or a t or a commercial and then fly back in time and then uh, i was also fundraising for a theater company theater under the stars which is the nation's largest nonprofit musical theater company all right and then uh, and then i uh uh, I was flight instructing on the side. I was doing all of those things. And then uh, in the late uh, mid eighties, the oil industry collapsed, just collapsed. So uh, there was a, uh, a real disaster in Houston because so much of the, of the, in, of the economy was based uh, on oil related industries. So they, uh, I'd been flight instructing there and uh, fundraising just bottomed out and, uh, uh, just the whole business uh, climate was so bad. So I decided to move to uh, Southern California to uh, flight instruct and then go after the acting field, you know, which I was enjoying so much. What year was this? 86. 86. 86. Yeah. So here I was in 86. I was a, an accomplished and flight instructor uh, pilot. And uh, I worked for a company that uh, where the guy that owned it was also an aircraft broker. Mm. So two, three times a week, there was a new airplane that came in and I'd check myself out in it. So I got to fly pretty much all the store bought airplanes. Okay. You know, out there. So I, I did that. What was yeah. the process for you to actually obtain your license to fly? I mean, it couldn't have been easy, right? <laughs> well, uh, it, it the hardest part was popping the uh, credit card down and going into debt. Really? That was the thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, I don't do things in a small way. You know, I go full out. Well, then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so this was a dream of mine. And when I, I found myself able to finally afford to get started, then I took over and I went into debt, uh, you know, from there. But uh, I was uh, dating a girl and she was late coming down the stairs before we went out to dinner. So I was watching her TV that was on and it was on a uh, public radio, public station. And there was a documentary on it. It was a young uh, actress who was flying a sailplane for her first cross-country flight mm -hmm. and i was looking at them i'm saying man that is so cool that's something i've always wanted so i jumped on uh you know there were some local publications that had all these different classes and so forth and i found mm -hmm. a flight school in the middle of the country that fl flew gliders so i went out and uh there was a guy there 
uh, Bob Hayward was his name. I'll never forget him. He, uh, he, my instructor did not show up. He looked at me, he says, are you waiting for something? I said, yeah, I was hoping to have a demo flight. He says, come on, I'll take you. So we get in this thing. He puts me up in the front of this glider and he's sitting behind me, stick and rudder all the way. We hitch up behind uh, the tow plane and we start going. He's got me following through on the stick, right? And we take off and we're climbing in tandem. And I'll send you some pictures of what that looks like from the cockpit. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, and we got to an altitude and then he said, reach up that yellow handle and pull it. And I pulled it and the tow rope fell away and we turned away and the, the, the tow plane turned away and he straightened it out. He says, okay, go ahead and take the stick. Oh, no way. And I, I didn't, didn't miss a beat. I took the stick. And I looked outside as I was flying and I said, I'm home. And this is the first time you've ever done this, right? Like you just, I'm home. I'm were, home. Were you, I wasn't, a, I wasn't, a, I mean, I could, I, I could, you know, hold her steady. I knew how to bank it. You know, I, I'd known some of that, okay. but I really had to use the rudders a lot in that glider, you know? So wow. uh, that was something. So uh, we did that. And in about 12 hours of training, well, let me put it this way. It was about 12 flights. Some of them were not very fast. They were up and down. Uh, he decided, he said, you know, they don't solo people soon enough around here. You're ready. So go ahead and solo. Wow. So I took off and did it. And everybody's Thanks. questioning, you know, Bob Hayward's. Yeah. Oh, so, 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 wow. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, he, uh, he turned me loose and I got up and, uh, you know, and I broke free and, and, uh, you know, uh, it released the, the, the tow rope and I ended up thermoing a little bit cause I had to wait for a couple of, uh, I was only supposed to go up, turn around and come back and land, but, uh, there were other aircraft in the pattern. So mm -hmm. I caught a thermal. So I started thermaling a little bit to stay up until the pattern cleared. Mm -hmm. Then I came in and, and landed and did a beautiful landing and uh, came to a stop and I was pretty, that was it. You know, I mean, I said, Cocaine, heroin, bring it. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, let, me, let me clarify something. So this sure. is the first time that you've ever, ever flown a plane before. Yeah, yeah. The same day, just a few hours later, your instructor. Well, it was about 12 flights later. It was several weeks later. So, you know, oh. I did have lots of training, you know. Okay. <clears throat> but it, I think it was about uh, a total of, uh, let's see, there were 12 flights. And I think it was probably somewhere in the 17 to 18 hour range where okay. he decided I'm ready to go solo gotcha. and go around the pattern. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah. First, they don't turn you loose until you're ready. You but know, that first that. flight though, that, that he, he gave you control of the, of the, of the plane. I do the same thing. If I were to go up with you on a lesson, I would have you taxing the airplane out. Wow. We would, you would have the hands on the controls following me through as we, I rotated and took off. Right. But once in the air, I say your airplane, Wow. your airplane, you take it. And I fold my arms like this. And you're going to look at me. Well, you're not even going to look at me. You're just going to have big, wide <laughs> eyes. Right. And, and, I, and you, then when you do chance to take a look at me, I'm going to go, I already know how to fly. You're the one that needs to learn. Right. So, so and, going, yeah. going up, is that something that you were expecting, like going up already? Or did, was that something that was completely unexpected to you? Uh, well, it was a demo flight. I was expecting to, to that first flight. Right. You're right. talking about? Yeah. I was not. I was expecting just to be a passenger. Oh, okay. OK, yeah. I, yeah. I was expecting he might let me handle the controls once, you know, that's to be expected. OK, but uh, once we were we were climbing out and this is before the tow rope was released, I remember looking out and just feeling like I was at home. I was I was supposed to be doing this. Mm -hmm. So when I when I did pull that lever for to release the tow rope, he said, you know, you've got the stick. And I took it and he talked to me through. He's basically started teaching me right away. Wow. But it just seemed a very natural, you know, it made sense. You right. know, uh, uh, there's a whole lot to learn, believe me. You know, so uh, over the next few weeks, a couple of weeks that I, that I was out there training, uh, I learned a lot, read a lot, uh, talked to a lot of different pilots. Mm -hmm. And when he thought I was ready to solo, that's, that's when it was time. And uh, so I did it, you know, and that's the process. You know, uh, right. if I were training you, I would get you to a point. Probably it's a little more intensive now because you know if you're not if you're lear learning at a country airport it's real easy but uh, you know if you're learning at a major airport uh, right. like you're you're near Hayward or Oakland uh -huh. there's a whole lot more to learn before you can be turned loose you know, right. with all those other airplanes and so yeah. forth so.
So you you, yeah. you you talked to me when you talked me through that story. It just felt like you got pretty emotional about it. Like, can you elaborate on that? Hmm. You get emotional about the things you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, what what I've seen over the years, and this happened to me too. Uh, it defines you. Uh, it validates you. It gives you a sense of. Uh, a sense of yourself and a sense of confidence. When you learn something like that, especially soloing, the first time I flew a, a power driven airplane, I went up, did my three landings, you know, and did that thing. And all the students from them, I tell them, and it's true, it changes you. You know, not everybody gets up and flies an airplane. No. So when they solo, <laughs> they get in that airplane, they're on their own. Yeah. Absolutely. I can't help. I can't help them once they're up there. Yeah. They come around. And they come in, they do that first landing. And I have them do uh, three. I have them do two touch and goes and then come back for a full stop. But I tell them, I said, you're, you're going to be talking to me in the airplane. I'm not there, but you'll be talking to me. Mm-hmm. But you're on your own. You know, you've done it. I failed the engine on you. I gave you a lot of emergency training. You've been able to handle it. You know what can happen. So in this pattern, anything that goes wrong, you've already seen it. Right. And you've dealt with it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now you're on your own and it's huge. And I've seen so many people change after being able to do that. I even got to the point where I wouldn't teach couples because uh, uh, a lot of guys that bring their wives along, let, they want the little lady to learn to land in case they have a problem. And she's kicking and screaming, doesn't want to really do this, but she's doing it for him. And she goes off with me without the husband. And I just treat him like a regular student. And we start going at it. And all of a sudden, they say to themselves, I can do this. This is fun. And the next thing you know, they're taking more lessons. At first, the husband's thrilled with this idea. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, she gets really, really good. And sometimes (laughs) she gets better than he is. (laughs) Love it. And that causes a little trouble Uh and some tension. Now, if it's a good, secure marriage, it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of marriages out there that aren't as secure as you think. <laughs> that's that's that I can see that happening. <laughs> Being jealous, like I, I brought my significant other out here so that he a little bit, not to be better than me, right? <laughs> she hits the ego, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, she ends up soloing before he did, wow. sooner than he did, mm-hmm. really taking it on. He's kind of jealous about that. And he'll say to her in the car, you know, you're enjoying your time with Mike a lot more than you're enjoying it with me. And -hmm. you know what she says? What? Nothing. (laughs) Awkward. (laughs) She says nothing. And that really eats at him. Yep. And before you know it, I'm training him too. And something's not right in our relationship as we're talking. And I see what's going on. I, I know I, I can recognize that. Uh, we'll split them up. Maybe she'll work with somebody else or he will or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know to get out of that, yeah, get myself out of the middle of that. But I have seen the split up. I've seen uh, when they feel empowered that they're able to do something really special. Because nobody can ever take that away from you. Right. Once you've taken off, flown around and landed Nobody could help you. Mm-hmm. You did that. Right. And because you did that, it's so empowering. And I've seen it change people's lives. I've seen a whole attitude change mm. uh, more than once, quite a few times. And, uh, and it does, it can change. Some. So it, it can be a very life changing event is what yeah. I'm saying. So yeah, I'm passionate about it because, you know, it's, it was, it was so important to me and I love sharing it. Gosh, I love sharing it, you know? Yeah, I can, I, I, can hear, I can hear it in your voice and I can see it in your eyes that you're, you know, very passionate about this. You've been doing it your whole life. You devoted, you know, a, a lot of years to this and training other pilots. So you know, I can definitely commend you for that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more now about, you know, Baron. I want to talk about Baron Hilton. I wanted to talk about some of the other people that you had the, the pleasure of meeting. And what was it like to, to be, you know, the, the pilot for Baron Hilton? Well, you know what? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some tidbits, but keep this in mind. I spent uh, 18 years mm-hmm. uh, with Baron Hilton, and uh, and I have such tremendous respect for the man. Uh, here's a guy that 
took over his dad's company that was worth in the hundreds of millions and grew it over 35 some odd years into a company that was worth when they sold it 29 billion dollars a lot of money they retired about six billion of debt leaving 23 he had you know a good five percent of that he had owned Harris. he had owned uh he was uh, caesar's entertainment you know caesar's palace paris las yeah. vegas hilton i was uh, just there <laughs> elvis worked for him okay that's how you know far back this went wow and he had set up uh, through his dad's foundation, his dad, Conrad, who started it, didn't give money to everybody. And he didn't get a lot, but he, he, 97% of his fortune went to the Conrad Hilton Foundation for charity. So when Barron comes back with these multi-billion dollars, he contributed 98% of his fortune to charity going for AIDS research, MS research, Mayo Clinic, water in Africa, Habitat for Humanity, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's huge, you know, for somebody to give 98% of a fortune away like that. That's the way he was. During Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina came and he had a friend of his who was a very liberal fellow. He says, Keen, come with me. They went to the phone and he called up the head of the foundation and he said, I want you to earmark $12 million for the Red Cross and earmark it for the Katrina victims. Boom. Just like that. He got right on it and did that without having been asked. So here's a guy that's just really, really uh, a top notch guy. I've flown for a lot of amateur human beings. Okay. Uh, a lot of people who can afford expensive airplanes and have a lot of money are not, you know, Usually people you want to hang out too much with on a Saturday night. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, uh, he was such a lover of aviation. So when I speak to you about him, I'm very careful because I was a gatekeeper. He was a target. Okay. Right. Everybody likes to sue the billionaire, find something wrong with it. Okay. Right. Uh, or they want something from him. So I was, I was kind of like a, a, a tour. I was like manager to a rock star. Yeah. Road manager, you know, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So I was kind of the gatekeeper in that. So I will share those really great things about you. Everybody has their idiosyncrasies, but he did not have an evil bone in his body. I'll tell you that right now. He treated people very, very fairly. So uh, the cool thing about him is he had such a passion himself for aviation that he ended up buying this ranch in Nevada. And uh, it's called the Flying M Ranch. And he has 5,700 feet of paved runway. On it. And he would fly to this ranch. And he had a lot of friends like Bob Hoover and uh, the great Society of Test Pilots, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, all these astronauts, they, you know, friends of his. Right. And he was at a, uh, at a dinner for the, you know, the uh, Society of Experimental Test Pilots. And they wanted to honor him as an honorary member. He said, no, I don't want to be that. You know, I'm not a test pilot. This is ridiculous. He does not like being honored for things that he wasn't responsible for. Mm -hmm. But at the dinner, there was a, a great test pilot, German test pilot, Hannah Wright. Now, Hannah Wright was, uh, was one of the lead test pilots for the Luftwaffe in World War II. Wow. She actually flew Hitler around quite a bit. Oh, way. Okay, but she was a test pilot, so you wouldn't have had the buzz bomb and a few other airplanes without her skills. So he, here she was at that dinner, sitting right next to Baron Hilton. And he turned to her and he said, what is your favorite airplane to fly? And she says, I like nothing more than to be up in a sailplane flying in my beloved Alps on a, on a beautiful afternoon. Mm. And he was talking to her about that. And he said, you know, I have a ranch along the Sierras in Nevada. Do you think that would be a good area for it? She said, it's one of the best in the world. He came back and his chief pilot at the time turned to him and he said, I want you to go buy me a glider. I want to learn to fly gliders. <laughs> so they showed up with uh, this Schweitzer glider and he learned to fly. And then he got to know some really great soaring pilots. And it wasn't long after that some of them got together and said, let's, let's have a competition. And it'll be a biannual event and it's gonna be worldwide. And the way you compete is you declare a triangular flight out and back. 
And whoever over that two year period in that country flies the longest triangular flight out and back, at the end of the two year period, they win the soaring cup. And then the reward, the prize is to come with a guest, all expenses paid to the Flying M Ranch and fly world-class gliders in some of the best soaring conditions in the world in the high Sierras. They ended up partnering with EADS, European Aerospace Defense Systems. That was, uh, oh, Airbus Industries. Uh, uh, that was Eurocopter, uh, Volkswagen. So big conglomerate. You know? right. So they, they, they uh, co-sponsored this thing. And uh, he said, well, let's, let's name it after Hannah. Right. And the German sailplane pilot said, Baron, you can't do that. Let's call it the Baron Hilton Soaring Cup. I said, no, no, I want to name it after her. And he said, Baron, you can't do that. Why not? Well, she was a Nazi then, and she's a Nazi now. <laughs> wow. So you can't, you can't name it after her. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's one of the curious things about that. So he ended up acquiescing. They called it the Baron Hilton Soaring Cup for, so for 36 years. It was a biannual event. Now, imagine you're having this huge thing where people come from all over the world to fly sailplanes. <coughs> imagine owning some great toys, mm. antique biplanes, aerobatic airplanes, helicopter, hot air balloons, right? You've got sporting play. You've got uh, skeet range. You've got hunting in the, in the off season. Well, you're going to attract some really neat people there. And he brought all his friends out there all the time he was so uh generous so that's where you end up with bob hoover and carol shelby of shelby cobra fame and you know bill anders gene cernan neil armstrong patty wagstaff who's one of the greatest pilots living uh three times united states aerobatic champion and uh you get to hang out with you know imagine yourself a you know you're a baseball fan you know you i'm i'm playing ball with babe ruth hank aaron you know, Ty Cobb, that was Jaeger. <laughs> uh, so, you know, these crazy. are great. And, yeah. and what, I mean, what is a common theme for all of these high, like ultra success, successful people that you're, you're meeting? Like what, what makes in aviation them, you know, or just in general, you know, what, what makes them so great? Like, I mean, if you're associating with Baron, like you're probably top notch. Well, so well I, I would, I would say that I would have called Baron from a lot of the herd you know, of, uh, of, of people like that, because he was a very exceptional man. Um, he, uh, he had a big heart and he, uh, he loved aviation. And, uh, if you met him, he would talk to you just like anybody, you know, uh, but quite often he, uh, he was surrounded by some really great people. That was the cool thing. And he was, he was, you know, part of his genius was surrounding himself with people that were really good at what they did. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, yeah. and, uh, and what, what we all wanted to do was uh, meet that standard. Yep. You know, the idea of disappointing him for some reason, just, right. you know, it just didn't, it just didn't work. You know, you could, yeah. uh, you know, you were there to do your job. So right. I was, I was, uh, when things were going well, Baron Hilton was the great host. The impresario, you know, he was, he was there when things weren't going well, I was the assistant host <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, where's Mike, you know, and I was yeah. the problem solver and I like doing that. Okay. I, when I see an issue, uh, if I don't like the way somebody's flying that airplane, they're going to have a conversation with me. So you're his right hand man. Mike, how, how did you get the uh, opportunity to even meet him in the first place? How did you get this gig? Uh that's a strange story right there. I've got all these stories. My goodness. You know, you, you've got a lot of editing to do here. I know that. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I had been uh, fly. I had, I'd gone off and I flew for Eastern airlines for a while. I was a 727 pilot and the, they went out of business. So I was out on the street looking for work. And uh, I came uh, back from that gig so I was flight instructing full time. And that's when I decided I had interviewed for a couple of really good jobs, Gulfstream pilot, you know, making good living. I had all these qualifications, mm-hmm. but it, when it came down to my, uh, my CV, my uh, resume, uh, they'd note that I didn't graduate high school. Right. 
So I decided, well, I better do something about that. I took the GED. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Orange Coast College, community college, and I enrolled in a couple of classes to see how it went. Right. Well, when you're close to 40 years old and going to school, you don't have a whole lot of distractions. And it was a lot easier than I thought. So I got a couple of A's and went, let's do this full time. So here I was a full time single parent, full time flight instructor, full time college student, <coughs> graduated with an associate degree, 4.0 plus. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was considered, quote, a reentry student and I was flat broke. They said, you are qualified for three free applications to any UC or Cal State school. Mm -hmm. You've got three free applications. And I said, OK, cool. I'll apply at UCI, UCR, right, which is near me. UCLA for film school, maybe, or something. You know, you still got those dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And then I had one left over and I thought, you know, what's the best UC school? And it's Cal, it's Berkeley. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I did a little research, found out not only they're the best, you know, they're the, the one of the top schools in the nation and the top public university, Yeah, you know. So I applied as an English major. I got accepted. UCI even accepted me and with a little stipend. But then out of the blue, I got this thick envelope from Cal. And the cover page said, congratulations, you are... Uh, accepted at University of California at Berkeley. And you are one of 15 people in the nation to be awarded the Regent Scholarship. And, that, and that, that's the full ride scholarship, right? Yeah. And wow. I'm the first person in my family, you know, we're all wow. working stiffs. First person in my family to go to college. That's crazy. So my son had just turned 18. Mm -hmm. uh, I took out a loan, got him an apartment because I said, hey, I can't pass this up. And I went up to Berkeley. That's crazy. And and I ended up. Uh, I did. I did okay. I did okay. Yeah, I mean that you're being I okay. You're gonna roll yeah. off your son too. I mean, just proving to him. Yeah. That at any age, you could always just flip a switch. Well, he went back later. He did the same thing locally here. He did community college and then uh, got his uh, associate degree that way on his own too. Well, here's the thing. So here I am, and I'm I'm uh, and I'm doing charter work, you know, and I'm flying some a lot of really spoiled rich people some of them are not fun at all you know they'll be kissing their wife and daughters goodbye tearfully and then the next group of people we pick up might be professionals in another field and you're heading to vegas ah <laughs> okay and uh you know that kind of stuff uh i flew different hollywood stars around and a lot of people who uh who were legends in their own minds you know a lot of that stuff and you you know how to deal with that sort of thing. But I flew a lot of people that uh, very transactional and uh, they didn't treat the pilots very good. And I had a couple of owners that would bounce checks on me. That's I'd walk into the hangar and I find that the airplane was gone. Well, it turns out the last flight was a demo flight. They, they had a cash flow problem, decided to sell the airplane. Oh, okay. So I'm out on the street again. So this was happening. <laughs> so I said, you know what? I got to get out of this field. I'll flight instruct for fun. I got to find something else to make money. At. I, I'm done with this. I'm so tired of working for amateur human beings. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, I'm resolved. I'm not, I'm not going to be a professional pilot. I'm just going to flight instruct for fun. And I get this phone call out of the blue. The guy's name is Art. Hi, Mike. Hi, Art. I got your name from the guys at Flight Safety. Flight Safety is uh, a, a huge training organization, probably the, 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 one of the world's finest. Okay. And that's where you go for your recurrent training, you get the simulator, they turn the heat up and they break things on you when you're flying and you have to solve the problems, okay? Oh boy. So I had, a, I had a little bit of a reputation there and a good one. So this guy tells me that he needs my services. And I said, well, Art, I'm thinking of getting out of this business. He says, I really need you. And I said, what's going on? Because he sounded really concerned. He said, well, I lost my medical. You have to get every six months or every year you do a medical evaluation. Okay. He examined if there's something wrong, you, know, right. you can't fly. Well, mm -hmm. well, I said, what's going on? He said, well, I got a little bit of heart rhythm problem. And we're trying to treat it with uh, drugs right now. But I'm going to know in three weeks whether I can get my medical back or not. I said, I'll tell you what, Art. I'll help you out. 
and I'll fly with you for the next three weeks. Cool. He, he asked me, he said, now, I understand you fly the, these particular citations. This one was the 560 Ultra. And I said, yeah, I fly all the 500 models. I also fly Lear and a number of others. And he said, well, we're going into mountain airports. And they tell me that you have a lot of experience going into the mountain airports in Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. I said, yep, sure do. He says, well, this one's going to Nevada. And I got 5,700 feet of paved runway, 5,000 feet above sea level. Here are the lat longs. Here's what we're doing. And I said, okay, I'll help you out on this. So I showed up. And Art was there with a guy who had just retired from United Airlines as 747 captain. They gave him three landings, and that qualified him as my right seat, second in command. Really? Well, I'm getting ready to go, and this white uh, Mercedes Benz drives up with a gray haired fellow in it. He gets out and goes, Hi, you might? And I said, Yes, sir. He says, Hi, Baron Hilton. Oh, <laughs> I, know, I know this one. <laughs> I knew about his aviation background too. You know, it's not, not just Mr. Hotelier, you know, right. Uh, not the big innkeeper. So we flew then to the flying M ranch, which was Disneyland for pilots, all these cool people, great airplanes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to fly a few of those and everything. Well, for th three weekends, we're going back and forth and art sitting right behind me, sweating bullets because he doesn't, he, he knows he's not flying his airplane. He doesn't know how long he's going to be kept on the payroll and so forth. Right. And here we got this retired United captain. He's fine. He's got a Porsche. He's got a second home on Catalina Island. And he's fine. He's no. not going to last. Living the right? good life. So uh, Art, uh, I said, you know, he's not going to stay around, Art. He goes, I know he's not. I said, why don't you come fly up with me? He said, well, you'd have to have your single pilot waiver. And I said, I've got my single pilot waiver. Really? Yeah. And I hand it to him. Next weekend, this 747 captain is gone. Art sitting in the right seat with me. Mm. We take off, fly to the ranch. We land at the ranch. And because I'm a flight instructor, I can flight instruct him. He doesn't need a medical to fly the airplanes with me. He checked me out in the steerman. I hadn't flown a steerman before, but I was, you know, tailwheel qualified. So technically I was pilot in command. Okay. So we had a great weekend. I'm working with all the clients and all, all of the guests. We get in to go home and I get in the airplane, start the engines. And I say, it's your leg, Art. And Art said, I don't have a medical. And I said, well, I'm not your friggin' doctor. Do you want the leg or not? <laughs> he says, yeah. He takes it. Great pilot. Takes off. We fly back to Van Nuys. It's about an hour flight. Mm -hmm. comes in just rolls it on like just perfectly you know really good pilot and as everybody leaves he turns to me with a tear in his eye says thanks for letting me have one more flight and i went oh no 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 <laughs> you are going to work I mean, you're not leaving here's the here's the deal i've got my single pilot waiver um and this is kind of gray area here uh i'm pilot in command i have to sit in that left seat be pilot in command Okay, there's no question about that. If we have three flights in a weekend, I get one of them. You can choose any two you want. I get one flight each trip. You get to choose. And we started from there. And for the next two and a half years, he got to keep flying. Eventually, he had a pacemaker. He got his medical back, but he was hard of hearing. and He was old enough to retire. And he decided he was going to retire. And at that point, here's something about Baron Hilton that's so cool. He accepted his resignation because he felt he was, Art felt he was taking advantage of Baron by this point, you know. And uh, he didn't want to leave, but it just made sense. Right. So Baron wrote him a letter, and the red letter, uh, Art read this to me over the phone. This is Baron Hilton. He says, Art, you were more than a pilot to me, you're a good friend. And I want you to know that you're not going to be missed because you can come up to the ranch anytime you want, fly any of the airplanes whenever you want. No. And for the next 10 years, that's what he did. He came up all the time. You know, no. I let him fly sometime right seat, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that was Baron Hilton. So he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, 
he didn't leave you behind, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, and that, and that all happened because you decided to be a good guy and, and come in and help out your friend here. And yeah, I, it was a, it was a, you know, I, it was supposed to be three weeks and then it ended up being 18 years. You know? <laughs> oh my God. That's crazy. How but it was, but I, you know, I, I didn't make a lot of money. I mean, I turned down some great paying jobs, but I would have been, you know, flying for a couple of monsters, you know, and, uh, God, one of these guys who wanted to be his chief pilot. He ended up going to jail for drug dealing and all kinds of things. Lost his Gulf Stream. And, Sounds like a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. I, I can't get into that probably for liabilities. I don't need him <laughs> coming after me. Fair enough. But, you know, there were enough of those, you know. So, uh, but but for the most part, uh, you know, I'm, uh, the last 18, 20 years have been really, really good when it came to the adventure. You know, I didn't make a lot of money. So, you know, I'm not retired in luxury here at this point still flying but uh but i uh, to me now it's it's all about the enjoyment of it uh, right. i i like i like flying jets i love flying small airplanes and i like flying gliders mm. uh, but now if i'm going to be teaching somebody it's because i really enjoy teaching them right you know and and uh if they get that mm -hmm. uh, that's cool. And it doesn't have to be an expensive airplane. So, so that's what you're still doing right now. You're just you're still I still fight and strike uh, instruct. I haven't been doing it during the pandemic. You know, that's a, that's a problem because uh, right. if I get sick, I'm not coming back. I have had my first dose of the Pfizer. Though, so I get my second one in about a week. Okay. Good. So uh, we'll do that. But, uh, and then I'm going to schedule some recurrent training, get back into to the jets again. Nice. Uh, and, uh, I love working with uh, young pilots. I I, uh, I I only train captains. I don't train co-pilots. Everybody I'm training is a captain, okay. and they're going to be a captain, and they're going to be training other captains. Nice. So uh, so I share that, you know. So it's it's my gift. It was a gift to yeah. me. So I, I share it as a gift. You yes. know, I'm, it's not unusual for me if I've got a scheduled two hour session to run it over an hour hour and a half. I don't charge for that. You know, yeah, you're essentially passing the torch over all the knowledge that you've, you know, gained over the past 18 or 20 plus years. How, how, how long have you been flying for? Uh, let's see, just about 30 years. So, so 30 years of experience and knowledge that you're passing on to the next generation of, of pilots and captains that are coming in. Um, yeah, why not? And, just, like and imagine, and imagine all the people I plagiarized. My goodness, you know, Bob Hoover, Chuck Yeager. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Armstrong was a great test pilot, you know, uh, and, you know, I got drunk with some of these guys, you know, it was, <laughs> it was great. Who, you know? who is the, who, I would say who's the funnest person to be around? Like, or maybe, maybe I should rephrase that. Maybe the most fun, because funnest is in the word. You know, you say the fun thing like that. Some of them were really, really challenging. Uh, I got really close with Chuck Yeager and Chuck Yeager is a difficult person with a lot of people. He and I hit it off for some reason. So for some crazy reason, we hit it off and just enjoyed flying together a lot. As a matter of fact, he asked me to train his second wife, you know, and uh, and I did that. Uh, Bob Hoover was just such a gentleman to be around. He's the guy that Chuck Yeager took his head off to. Uh, mm -hmm. You might not know him, but uh, he's one of the greatest sticks in the, in the world. Uh, I'll, I'll look up all of these. These, yeah, people and I'll put the pictures in on the edit. <laughs> I fished a lot. I got spent a lot of time with Gene Cernan, who is one of my favorite astronauts. Neil Armstrong, you know, uh, just just wonderful to be around. You know, and and uh, and you know, you're on a first name basis. You're flying together. You know, when uh, when uh, the crowds got too thick, I could get them out the back door. You yeah. know, that kind of thing. You know, so I was I was that guy. You know, so. Uh, mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that. So like interesting, uh, interesting individuals, I would have, would imagine. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then you know they'll bring some other political types. You know, at times we'll show up and uh, we'll we'll show them a good time. But they weren't on the list. <laughs> there, there, there was a there was an A list, a B list, a shit list. All right, <laughs> and then there was the list where they get anything they want list mm. because they're favorites, right. and those are the ones. Those are the ones we called and cultivated made sure that there were certain special weekends right. okay. that we would alert Baron. He needed to invite them. the hierarchy. But, yeah. But nine times out of 10, Baron knew how to put his, uh, his uh, guest list together. So it was that, and it was so chock full of adventure and excitement yep. in so many ways, you know, yeah, especially like, the international events, you know, it sounds like Baron is like a, ma a master networker. 
is really good at putting people together in one place and, and, and making friends with people that are in high places. It sounds like, you know, uh, yeah, he, he draws that himself. He's at the center of a network, but that's not his purpose. He is not, he doesn't set out in the morning to build a network. Right. You know, that, that's the it, thing. It he's really he's doing business and so forth. And he's attracting these people. And uh, I used to joke with him every once in a while. I'd say, you know, Baron, my dad used to say that you were, you were, uh, you're judged by the company you keep. And I used to say, Baron, you're guilty as charged. Guilty of, oh, guilty as charged. Oh. Guilty as charged. Yeah. And uh, he'd kind of look at me strangely at times and I'd say, no, really. Because, you know, look at, look at who you surround yourself with. Right. These guys are great. You know? So that was it. Sounds like so, it. Uh, so I, I got to share, I got to share a lot of really special moments with him too. A lot of these things I don't share because uh, he was, uh, he was, he, he doesn't, did, did not want to aggrandize himself. He, he didn't like getting the attention. He'd rather have his, the attention diverted to his dad, Conrad Hilton. Okay. You know, so uh, so he was he was really pretty cool. It was a great example for me to to yeah. follow in many ways. You know, yeah. So well, you that, are that's just, it. You are just full of stories, and I would imagine that you have a ton more from all of these individuals that you've met. You've probably learned a lot from just flying people around in general over the past thirty years, specifically. Yeah, well, that I can I can brag about that. I can't brag about my financial acumen, uh, but I but I got a lot of stories. But a lot, of, like right. I said, I've plagiarized. You know, a lot of my knowledge from these people and, that's and, pa and pass it on. So uh, reinvent the wheel, but honestly, like the, just the experiences alone, like I always say that I, I'm a pretty minimalist person. I literally have like five of these same shirts. Um, if I were to spend money on anything, it would be experiences. So the, the, the fact that you have all of those years of experiences with some of these, you know, fantastic, just very bright, intelligent people that are very high performing as well. And you're able to, communicate that with with people like me and it's just it's very it's a blessing to, to be able yeah. to, to hear some of those stories so i appreciate that i love sharing but i also i also have uh, an ulterior motive especially the aviation stories uh when i'm teaching because i'm i'm keeping people safe yeah uh you yeah. know uh we make a lot of mistakes out there a lot of errors yeah and uh, i've never made an advanced aviation error in my entire career wow Every error has been a simple, fundamental error. Mm. Something that you would make as a student or as a low-time pilot mm -hmm. or as an accomplished pilot. We, we make fundamental errors. Right. And, uh, and we need to be on guard for that because, uh, you know, we can, I can be as arrogant as the next person, you know. Um, and I could be overconfident, you know. And I could, I could base a decision of flying or not flying go or no go based on all my years of experience. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of people with years of experience that get into accidents. Yeah. You still make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, I do. It's so important to have a mentor to help you, you know, navigate through those landmines as well. Right. If, if they're, if they're straight up and, and, and pilots, accomplished pilots love being very candid. They love this conversation. Mm -hmm. Let me tell, let me tell you how you're going to die. Hmm. Okay. Let's talk about maybe the five <laughs> different traits that cause accidents. And by the way, I've got all five. All right. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so you have a conversation that starts like that and they're right. all ears because, you know, we, we don't want to make the same mistakes. So how many ways are there learning something? One is by reading, by listening and watching somebody. And other people have to take their hand and put it right on the hot griddle to find out for themselves. Right. Yeah, well, which one do you want to be? You hopefully know? that hot griddle isn't something that can get, you know, yourself or other people hurt, right? Well, uh, you know, I, I know there's been a few times I've gone the hot griddle route. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, so that learned here. something. So you're still here though. So there's that. So, so far, so far, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I, <laughs> right. I had an issue came up some months ago where uh, there was a possible pilot deviation. And, uh, and I teach this stuff, especially in what they call a NORAD or no radio environment, mm. where we had lost communications and so forth. And I used uh, prescribed techniques, the FAA the National, and the uh, Airman's Information Manual. I teach this stuff. And uh, I ended up uh, doing, I didn't go right into land. 
And the controller is really upset about that because I, you know, I'd lost communications and I wanted to reestablish communication before I went into a busy terminal environment. Mm. And uh, he took exception at that. So they, uh, they tried, so they, they put it down as a possible pilot deviation. A few months later, I had an inspector call and I walked him through it. And I said, if I had it all to do over again, I would have done exactly the same thing. And as we walked through it, the inspector said, yeah, you're right. Mm. And I said, yeah, I teach this for a living. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is have a conversation with that air traffic controller and let them know what we came to. And, uh, and I said, and I'm not pushing anything here, but we're all making mistakes up there, especially during this COVID issue when people right. are overworked or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so this time, maybe he made the error. But I remember when I made the error and, and they cut me some slack. So I'm not going after anybody. Just, just remind them that we're all on the same team here and it's all about safety. Right. So, I mean, it, there, there's a lot more to that story, but I, you know, it's, it, you know, if you were, if you were in training, I'd be giving you the whole story mm -hmm. because there's lessons to be learned from that. But the right. main thing is, is that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, you know, if they make a mistake, the air traffic controller, they what? They fall, what, like 18 inches? <laughs> they don't have a whole lot. They don't have far to go before they yeah. hit the ground. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I have a little higher. Yeah. You know, so anyway. It's a team team effort, right? For sure. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, just one last question. I'm just wrap sure. up here. Really appreciate, like I said, all the stories that you've shared with me thus far. But really, just for the listeners that have made it this far, you, do you have any you know, lasting words of wisdom for the listeners today that you'd like to share? Uh, well, Chuck Yeager used to say fly safe to all the pilots. Okay. Okay. And uh, I, I just want to share something that a friend of mine who flew for an Australian airline and this airline had never had a major fatality. And I asked him, why is that? He says, because early in our training, we were taught we're not God. Real early in our training. So that, that's the thing, you know, pay attention and uh, and don't hurt anybody, especially yourself. I like it. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hey, that was fun. I, you know, I just rambled and rambled. So you got a lot of editing. To do. I've, I've got so <laughs> much content, though. So I appreciate that. I'm sure that yeah. the are going to be really happy with that. I'm going to put a lot of pictures in, in, of the people that you had mentioned, as well as the, the different you know, planes that you had have flown in the past. But thank you again for your time. I, re I really appreciate it. I might, I might shoot you a few photographs. I'll email a few of you that you might want to use. Yes. So uh, I'll be expecting that then. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, appreciate you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you again for your time, Mike. Have a great rest of your day, okay? Enjoy your weekend. Take care. Thanks for the fun. No worries. Okay. Right. Bye Take now. care.